This is the Collector Car Podcast, the home for the auto enthusiast. Join Greg Stanley as he applies over 25 years of insights and analytical experience to the collector car market. He will interview the experts and throw in some fun stuff as well. Do you find it challenging working on your collector car? Advantage Lifts has the solution for you with their selection of two and four post lifts. Advantage's two post lifts provide an unparalleled amount of versatility. Each wheel can spin freely and be worked on individually, and you'll have full access to those hard-to-reach parts of the undercarriage. And best of all, Advantage's two post lifts are ready to ship now. Get $100 off by using code TCCP for the Collector Car Podcast. Again, that's TCCP. You can find your perfect Advantage lift by calling 763-300-5730. That's 763-300-5730. And don't forget to use the promotional coupon code T. CCP. Hey, it's Greg Stanley. If you're listening to this podcast, you know I love everything automotive. This passion has expanded to include being a car specialist consultant for RM Sotheby's. So if you need assistance buying or consigning a collector car at any one of our online or live auctions, including Scottsdale, Amelia Island, or Monterey, you can reach one of our car specialists at rmsotheby's.com or you can email me directly at gstanley at rmsotheby's.com. Well, welcome to the Collector Car Podcast. This is the Mega Monterey Review Part 2. If you caught up with us last week, you know that we had Rory Carroll on reviewing a bunch of the cool cars. You're probably wondering why I did not mention one car in specifically, and that would be our headlining car, the 1955 Ferrari 410, this incredible race car. And I thought, you know what? Let me get an expert on the podcast to talk more about it. So I like to uh, invite automotive historian, John Ficara. John, how you doing today? Good. How you doing? Good, good, man. We met, I guess it was last year, this year, at Amelia. Yeah. I think. Yep. yep. And uh, I love what you do. I love what you do on VinWiki. I love that you've launched your own YouTube channel. So before we get into this historic Ferrari race car, tell us a little bit more about you and what you're up to today. Well, um, my name is John Ficara. I am a professional automotive historian, but I also work in the field to advise collectors on their, their collections, on purchases and sales. I have my own shop here at my house. We have some relations, restorations, and uh, yeah, I've got a, I've been on VinWiki's car stories for the last, geez, this has started, so about four or five years, and racked up wow. a few million views on there. So I thought it was time to uh, start my own channel. So we started a channel called Fakara Classic, and um, I got about six, eight videos up. I'm trying to put one up every couple of weeks and get a, a nice audience going. But it's pretty much me working on some of the weird cars in the garage and talking about some of the cars that I'm advising on or if we get a car that comes by that I get to drive. So right now we've got an IMSA 914-6 in the garage. And um, I've got my six-wheeled Range Rover, which I'm prepping. And uh, I've got a Jaguar D-Type. Uh, not a real one, but, uh, <laughs> uh, we've got, you know, I've got, I usually have about 14, 15 cars on the property that we're working on or playing with. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I, I'm just a car guy. I just love cars. I love all cars. So I'm the guy that everybody calls about any question about cars. Usually. <laughs> That's great. And I started watching a couple of your videos the other day and, um, it was the VW thing, which may or may not be an Acapulco edition, right? So we yeah it, it we found out that it is it has oh. all the identifying marks of Acapulco so that was that was a nice find yeah absolutely yeah well tell our listeners how's an Acapulco thing different than a regular VW thing <laughs> well <laughs> the uh, the Acapulco version was developed for these resorts in Acapulco Mexico and they were blue and white they were a white car with blue stripes um, and they were, you know, they'd take people to the beach or the airport and so forth. So Volkswagen got on the kick and they're like, hey, we should make a few of the special editions of this for people that they can buy. And it had a really cool Surrey top. It didn't have a regular folding yeah. top. It had this really tall top with stripes on it. It looked like something from Fantasy Island, the old, the old Fantasy yeah. Island show. Um, and there's not a whole lot of them left because most of them got wrecked or, you know, dissolved into the ground. But the one we found has identifying marks. They're painted blue underneath the dashboard. Um, there's mountings for the side. They have these um, kind of side skirt panels that go between the fenders. Yep. Uh, most of them have them on there now, but these came with them. 
there's a bunch of little things that identify it. So we, I reached out in one of my videos, I asked a bunch of experts, I'm like, what should I look for? How do I figure it out? And a couple of guys were like, yep, what you got, that's the right VIN number range. Oh, and yeah. that's all the identifying marks. So we'll call it an Alcofulco. That's really cool. Yeah, they're yeah. really cool. I've seen them at auctions for years. You don't come across them often, especially the real ones. And I'm, I'm a car nerd. I love the identifying <laughs> marks, you know, all that fun stuff. How can you tell if it's real or not real? So uh, just a quick note to the folks that are listening via uh, the podcast. If you do want to see the videos and our pretty faces with our grain beards, uh, just go to the YouTube <laughs> channel <laughs> and you can you can uh, see the video or see the pictures of these cars that we're talking about today. So that's great, man. So everybody needs to check out your uh, YouTube channel. I'll have all the uh, links in the description of this podcast. So, well, so I reached out to you, to, very specific reason to ask you about this incredible Ferrari that we have coming to our Monterey sale. As you listen to this, this posts on Thursday, the sale is Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. It's happening Saturday night. And, you know, in the in the world of the auction world and the car collectors, you know, it's got a big number on it, 25 to $30 million. And I've honestly heard a couple people say that's that's soft. And it, which is crazy when you think about that, you know, but then you think <laughs> yeah. about historic Ferraris. I'm really curious to see what it sells for. Obviously, I think everybody will be. You know, at the auctions, people have their camera phones going on when it's a million dollar car. You know, I can't imagine what's going to happen when it's a 20 plus million dollar car. So if you would kind of give us an overview of your thoughts um, about this historic race car, what you found interesting and exciting about it. Um, just generally your your thoughts from a historical perspective. Well, I mean, uh, that to me is what is the value of a car is its history, is the story behind it. Um, because one car... And another car, if you crush them up in a ball, are worth the same in scrap, right? So the story of this car is what makes it worth $20, $30 million, maybe more. Um, you know, it's one of a couple that were built. It was built for a specific race um, to race through Mexico, and it never actually got to do because in 55, a lot of the big races got canceled because of the horrible accident in Le Mans that year with the Mercedes. Yeah. So it was never actually raced in the race it was built for. So it it moved through like uh, Fangio got to drive it. I mean, if the maestro has driven anything, right. you can add a couple million dollars to it right there. Right? <laughs> right. So he drove it for Ferrari when it was a Ferrari car. But since it never was going to race in the kind of racing it was intended in the sports car category, uh, they sold it to one of the greatest privateers ever, which was the Edgar team out here in California. And so you've got another famous name attached to it. He then gets a young driver who's on the up and come name, uh, Carol Shelby. Right? Now who's so that? <laughs> yeah. Who, who, what that? What's that guy? That chicken farmer guy from Texas? Right. Like uh, chili. <laughs> yeah. He, so you, now you've got Shelby's name attached to it. And according to its history, he had his, his most you know wins in that car. Um, it was a phenomenal car. I really think this car is special aside from it being a big displacement Ferrari on a, what was built to be a very low frame uh, to handle kind of the Mexican roads. Uh, you know, it was especially built short wheelbase because of the way the car's built. It was perfect for uh, Shelby's kind of character and mm. the way he drove. But I'm pretty sure this car had a huge influence on how he built the Cobra. You're yeah. talking about a small short wheelbase car with a big engine, lots of power, how you drive it with the throttle. Um, this was like a Cobra Ferrari. It was a it was a beast of a car to drive, from what I understand. I would love to drive it. If anybody, <laughs> whoever buys it, you know, I'll, I'd love to do an episode on your new car. You know, just give me a call. But I, um, I'm right there with you. Give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> give us both a call. <laughs> that, that that car, you know, Shelby brought was 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 the big up and comer. He became the Sportsman of the Year for Sports Illustrated, and after that, of course, it was a meteor. Uh, for him, just, you know, his his ascent in the car world. And, of course, he won Le Mans in 59 and then retired as a driver. We all saw the movie, you know, so we know all the, those answers now. But uh, so that car, part of that, his story arc. And then, um, you know, it, it went to uh, the NART team, I think, was the next thing. It was Keaty's car. And uh, they raced it, like, in the Bahamas or somewhere like that, I believe. And it, it kind of petered out and then just became – an old race car at that point. Um, you know, people people need to understand that old race cars back then 
were obsolete in a few years when the rules changed. Uh, you know, nowadays, F1 cars change every like five, seven years. Like it's a, it's a long time they race under spec. But back then, cars would change every year or every two or three years. And when you had a used race car, you just chucked it away. Right. You know? Right. And that happened a lot to oh, so many famous race cars that I've uh, had the pleasure of doing the histories on. And you find out they were in somebody's garage for a decade or, you know, play, you know, it, it was it was lost in a fire. But then they found it under a burnt down house, like crazy stories. This car, you know, fortunately doesn't have any gaps in its history, which is another right. super important thing for value is that the story, every owner is legit from the beginning all the way to today. So there's no missing empty pockets in his provenance. L legitimate real collectors owned it. It was restored by real Ferrari guys. It wasn't like it ended up in, you know, the, the back hills of Los Angeles and some guy was, you know, <laughs> swapped the Chevy V8 in it for 10 years. That car has its matching numbers engine. It is the real deal. And, and that's so rare. Uh, if you think about how old that car is, yeah. you know, you, you, you need a 70 year old man. He's not all original. He's got extra new hips, <laughs> things like that, right? To find a really, like, really correct vintage Ferrari on top of the fact of its rarity, uh, that car is astronomical. Yeah, so you, you're layering it pretty much. You're looking at, you know, the originality, the provenance, you know, the race history, which obviously is the comes to the drivers. You know, who piloted the car adds to that history. History makes it so rich. And what I one thing I love about that, and I'll throw a picture up here is. Shelby signed it, which he signs a lot of stuff. Obviously, or did. he would have signed. He would have signed your mom if you paid him enough. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yep. But this one's cool because it says, I believe it says, "Mr. Ferrari told me this was the best Ferrari he built," or something to that effect. You know. Yeah. yeah. And, he, and so, he he signed that in like the two thousands, I think. Right. Yeah. It was it was much. It wasn't like he signed it the day he raced it. No, no, that would be really cool. <laughs> that would that would have been cool if they had like they gone for the restoration and underneath it he had written something, a message. Um, I don't put a whole lot of value on his later signatures. I know a lot of people think that's like, you know, the blessing by the Pope or something. Right, right. But I mean, he would, he would sign Cobra kit cars on their yeah. glove boxes. And uh, he was, if anything, he was a showman and he, and he knew exactly where to put his, his name. And that was a great place to put his name. And it's nice to have a signature on it. But I don't think that adds... A million dollars in value no. today, right? Right. right. But, right. but it's it's a nice little touch. It's a nice touch. And I, I have to say this: I, I read the, um, the description uh, that the, uh, the auction house put out, and this is something I'm immensely critical about. Uh, auction houses don't technically have to tell the truth or right. do a lot of research on the cars. They're not responsible for that. This is a little disclaimer. Um, but and so I find a lot of mistakes. And that's owners hire me to read these things and, and evaluate how much the truth is. And I thought this one was really well written. Um, so I recommend people to go read it. I don't know who the author is, but it was it was very clearly written. It was laid out really logically. And it was it, the research has been done on this car. And uh, so I would just tell people to go to the catalog or online and check out the, the actual description. It's, it's, it's page after page. And it's a great story. I'm glad you said that because I consult with RM Sotheby's. And in my brief tenure with them, I I can tell you there's some stuff that has not made it into the catalog because they're very tight on proving it. You know, they don't just throw anything, which I which to your point, not every auction house does this, but they're very conscious about, well, we can't say that, you know, because we don't have the proof, which is, you know, great to see from the inside looking out, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah, and, and it's because it's always buyer beware. Even if it's a if it's a five thousand dollar car or a five million dollar car, it's the same amount of research you got to do. Make sure you're getting what you're buying. Um, I've actually been responsible for a couple of cars being pulled from auctions because I've found things out about them before they went up, and told the prospective owners that, and then they contacted the auction houses and had the car was pulled. I'm not gonna say what cars, but it's happened a couple times. Where and, and this is to the credit of the auction house is they're like oh well it's not a real car or there's some question to it we don't need to put our name on it they take it out um, and if you think about how much money an auction house makes on a multi million dollar car you know the temptation to leave it in there and to sell it is huge 
But to their credit, you know, that's their reputation. And I think RM Sotheby's does a, does a really good job. Well, it's funny because mine was not a million dollar car. Mine was like a $45,000 Torino or something. And it was featured in some Ford magazine. But because I didn't have the Ford mag or the owner didn't have the Ford magazine, we couldn't say that. And so we pulled the bullet point out until we actually found the magazine. Then we got it back here. You know, it was something to that effect. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, you want to be as truthful as you can. Um, well, that's awesome. No, I really appreciate your time. I do want to go through a couple other things, I guess. Mm -hmm. Just in general, I don't know how how close you are to the market. I would assume you're pretty close based on your experience here. But what do you think is going on in the marketplace right now? Do you think we peaked? Do you think we were about to peak? Do you think we got another six months to go? I mean, what what's your feeling out there? That's like the $10 million question going around right now. Yeah, you know, it's it's tough. This is mid-season. Um, there's been some amazing prices this year. There's been amazing cars available this year. Really, that's kind of what happens is, uh, all of this is cyclical um, and you can kind of track it over time. There's peaks and valleys, right? Like we, we were kind of at ascending into a peak. COVID did some weird things to the market and actually brought a lot of cash to the table because people weren't doing anything for a long time. Yeah. And suddenly they're like, well, you know, I didn't take three vacations. So boom, I'm going to go buy myself a really expensive car. Uh, there's a lot of money moving around. There's a lot of money now in classic vehicles um, from the Pacific Rim, and there's a ton of money there. And they're starting to start to take real interest in racing and historic racing. Uh, I think the market's going to continue going up. Uh, collectibles in times of, of you know, variance in, the, in like the stock market and in, you know, in inflation and so forth, collectibles are always a great investment because they're a nice continuous growth market. Um, and the trick is, is buying the right vehicle at the right time. Like if you bought an air-cooled 911 10 years, 12 years ago, you'd be sitting right before they really took off and you'd yeah. be sitting on $100,000. That's kind of where people hire me to kind of find out what car is on what arc because every car is different. Um, and so I, I think there's, there's a lot of money out there. I think there's a lot of good cars. And that's the other thing was that a lot of time, uh, there's a huge market, prices go big, everybody starts fixing up any piece of garbage they can find and they flood the market with junk and you and the prices start dropping because the cars aren't that good. Right. And we went through a little bit of that a couple of years ago where, you know, oh, well, you know, for instance, like the Jag E-Type went through that many years ago yeah. where they weren't worth anything. Suddenly they're worth $100,000. Everybody took every junk pile they could and fixed it. And then the prices drop because most of the ones in the market were just awful. Um, but when you're talking about the upper echelon cars, like this 410 and those, they, they, they're on another planet. And the people right. who buy them on another planet. True. Those yep. will always continue going up in value. If you go buy yourself a Porsche 917 and you sell it 10 years from now, you're going to make some money. Right. Um, if you buy an old Lincoln Continental, I can't guarantee that. <laughs> <laughs> my philosophy like I have, I have a very simple philosophy and that is cars are bought um, based on and values are based on rarity and emotion so for example you can have a really rare car that nobody knows about like I had a 66 Maserati Quattroport beautiful car yep. quad cam V8 four wheel disc brakes five speed transmission an amazing car Nobody knows about it in yeah. the United States. It's almost worthless here, but it's a super rare car. And then you have like a Mustang, which has a lot of emotion. Everybody loves an old yeah. Mustang, but they made millions of them. So they're not worth a whole lot of money, they're, you know, right. 30, 40. Grand. But when you can get emotion and rarity together, like this 410, that's when the prices go astronomical. So those are the questions I always ask people when they're starting to look for a collectible car. What is their priority? Are they emotional about it? Do they want something rare? Is it something that they're going to sell later? But really when it comes down to it, it's about buying something you love because if the price goes up or down, it shouldn't matter. You know, right. not a lot of people become millionaires buying and selling classic cars. You're usually a millionaire who goes and buys the classic car, right? <laughs> right, right. So you, you can't, you be, if you're buying like an old, like, Porsche 928. Buy it because that was your favorite poster car from the 80s. 
not because you think they're going to triple in price, which they may. They are they are going up right now, but buy because you love it. That way, that emotional content doesn't really matter anymore. It's just based on you know what you want that you want to keep it with your money right now. And, yeah. be, and it, usually, usually you're happy and it'll go up in price. But that's the joy of owning a classic car, right? It's because you love it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. If you buy what you love, you'll never have any regrets, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, that's great advice. Yeah, I've noticed some of the trends have flattened and slightly declined in the last year. Now, a lot of that's because these cars were on a tear. You know, you look at the last three years, Dodge Viper is up 150%, you know, first gen. And the last year, it's, you know, flat. Well, you know, that's uh, that's expected, <laughs> you know, that kind of yeah, stuff. So it's, it's also generational where you can, you can pretty much make a, a bell graph and put it on a, a timeline. And what it is, is that you, all you got to do is trace back the current generation's 40s or 50s, then go back to what car was popular when they were in high school. Mm -hmm. And that's the car that hit. So right now, Gen X, who didn't have any money to buy a Viper when they came out, right, in 90, like the, I didn't have that kind of money in 1990, I could buy one now, their values go and explode as the generation comes in and wants them. So that's those that cars attract. Then what happens is once that initial um, desire, the appetite has been appeased by the market, it always has a tendency to drop a little bit yeah. because it's like those first buyers want to be in quick, get everything. And then what happens usually is there's a little dip and then it starts, if it is a true classic or it is truly in the market, it'll start rising again pretty steadily. Um, and that happens over and over again with cars like that. It's interesting. And I don't want to go on too big of a tangent here, but it's very interesting. I mean, 57 Chevys went down and, and you know, now they're going back up because exactly what you said. Now, 57 T-Birds haven't quite recovered like the Chevys, you know, and I love what you said about, you know, what 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 you loved when you were young. I've been doing a deep dive on Jay Leno's collection and I, I did the math and I, I figured out the car that the year that he has the most of is in his collection is 1966. And now why is that? Well, that's when he turned 16. Yep. And so, you know, it's no, you know, it's not a fluke that those are the year that he has most in his collection. Cause he was, you know, he was like me going nuts, 15, 16 years old for all these old cool cars or new cool yep. cars. Right. I say, just, just look at the poster cars. You know, what did you have on your wall when you were in high school? And it, Pretty much every single one car I had with like a, a 288 GTO, you know, they took a big, they took a big, huge jump in the last few years. And all the ones like uh, even like even the Lotus Esprit, which was a cool poster on the wall and they weren't worth anything. Even they're gaining yes. in value. I don't understand why, but they're gaining in value because, you know, it's the old James Bond car. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's it's I always tell people, like, look, what did you like in high school? What was the ultimate car in high school? That's that is going to be a collectible car, not, you know, your parents Caprice Classic you drove in high school. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right. Right. But what was the one that sat in the corner? Like, you know, your friends, you know, Scirocco that had the trick Kami body kit on it or, you know, something that was really sweet that you couldn't afford. Like, I, I have one of the. Audi Quattro, um, 1985 Audi Quattro cannonball cars. Wow. And when I was in high school, there was a kid who had one of those Audi Quattros with the body kit on it. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. So now I got one. And now yeah. the price is starting to go up. So that's you just follow that market. Yeah. No, that's really cool. Well, I did want to give you a couple more cars from the Monterey auction uh, that have historical significance. And honestly, uh -huh. I just want to know your thoughts on them. I'll give you four cars here they're all they all have some type of racing history sure. and i, I just kind of you know give me you don't have to give me your thoughts on all four maybe just one or two or whatever you want so let me give you four cars here i'm curious all right i'll start from the oldest to the newest uh, we have a 1927 miller 91 mm. yeah you don't see yeah. um estimate on that one 700 to 850 we have a 1967 porsche 911 rally coupe Nice. It's a rare fact, you know, factory rally estimates 650 to 800. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Next is a 1998 Ferrari F300, Michael Schumacher champ or uh, winning race car. And then we also, the last one is 2004 Jeff Gordon NASCAR. Now, let me say, I think the Ferrari is, I want to say six to 8 million. And then, and then the Jeff Gordon car is 150 to 200 grand. 
Yeah. So what are your thoughts on those from a historic perspective and within the marketplace? Because I know a lot of it, at least in my mind, has to go to usability. You know, can you use yeah. this car in a historic event, a racing event, or not? So what are your thoughts? Well, the Miller 91 is one of the most legendary early pre-war race cars. And uh, Miller's engine, I mean, that's a whole episode yeah. unto itself. But that car is stellar. There is a rising interest in pre-war race cars. Uh, and, and and if you had to get one, you, you absolutely want to get a Miller. The, the, the supercharged straight eights they had in them were just off the charts. The driving experience, there's nothing more raw than an early car like that. That's amazing. Um, the Porsche, of course, if you can get a factory rally car, 911, uh, yes, please. <laughs> you know, like, that's a no brain. Those are all, all, they're all four of those are no brainers. Like, cause the, the rally efforts are a lot of things people who have Porsches nowadays don't remember that they were not only immensely dominant on the road courses, but they were dominant in rally racing as well. And the 911, when it came on the boil, in the late 60s it stormed everywhere it took everything and those short wheelbase 911s with all the lights on them and stuff yep. like, oh heck yeah um <laughs> then uh you know a, a schumacher car that's that that deserves the least comment because that's a no-brainer um you know even if lewis hamilton does get an eighth world championship you yeah. talk about one of the greatest drivers of all time in a Ferrari where he won all the majority of his championships. Like, yeah. I mean, just to have that in your living room and sit in it and pretend <laughs> to be like a Schumacher or whatever you want to do with it, hang it on the wall, drive it, please. Um, yeah, that's, and that's a car guaranteed. That's, there's, there's, there's no question about that car gaining in value over time. Um, and then the stock car, like, it's interesting. Stock cars don't have as much value as other race cars, mostly because, and I can't speak to modern stock cars because I I know I did re I do research on older ones, but they usually make like six a season. Right. They never really kept track of which one did what race. Like if you try to research old old ones, they're like they would bring three, and whatever one was fastest was the one they ran, and nobody would keep any records of it. So. When you see racing history for specific chassis for stock cars, they're really iffy. And those cars were beat up and smashed around, and there's nothing exotic about them at all, which, yeah. is, which is great because, you know, if you can find an old 80s and 90s stock car, they're not expensive. I mean, Gordon's name adds, I think that's where the value of that yeah. car is uh, because you can find great old stock cars for 40 grand that you can just put some tires on it and go hog wild. And a lot of the, the classic, the problem is once you have one, what the hell do you do with it? And there are a lot of the historic racing organizations that are allowing these stock cars in because they used to only allow the stock cars with drum brakes for years. And I think they're recognizing there's a whole new generation that want to race vintage stock cars. It's weird to say that in the 90s, you know, yeah. one is a vintage <laughs> stock car, but it is. Um, but you can, you know, parts of stuff you can get off of, you know, Summit Racing or go down to Napa and fix your race car. So I, I, I tell people, like, if you want to get into something that's stonking fast and it's already built by professionals and it's got the strongest cage you're going to find in a race car, then go get an old NASCAR. Um, you know, the the long term on a, a NASCAR is, I don't think, as strong as something like, obviously, Schumacher's car, uh, but they're, they're great cars to, to drive and race. It's something you'd, you'd buy to actually use it instead of just right. sticking at it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, for listeners, take a listen or take a look at my YouTube channel. I just posted uh, cars from the Indy uh, Motor Speedway where it was a vintage event. And I did get a shot of all the NASCARs uh, passing by headed to the track. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. They're super loud and yeah, super fun. So, well, cool, man. Was there anything else you wanted to cover before we wrap up with a little game of keep cash or crush? Nope. I mean, yeah, no, this has been fun so far. I mean, <laughs> I, can I plug my, my channel again? Go yes. to Fakara Classic. Go to Fakara Classic on YouTube and subscribe. I'm going to have a lot of content. I just drove uh, a 50 year old Jaguar to Alaska and we jumped it off a cliff for the 4th of July. And I'm working on those episodes right now. So I've got a lot of weird, strange content coming up. 
Now that had a British flag on it, right? I, it was. What what they did is they celebrate the Fourth of July and they jump cars off a cliff because you can't see fireworks late at night in Alaska. <laughs> it doesn't get dark till it's midnight. So this this uh, town called Glacier View, this awesome guy named Arnie, uh, organizes like ten cars to jump off a three hundred foot bluff and land right in front of 5,000 people. I mean, right in front of you. They smash down in front of you. And I saw them jumping all these things over the years, and they always were covered with American flags. And they were like Jeep Cherokees and things like that. And I'm like, no, you're missing the point. You're missing the point, yeah. This is the 4th of July. You got to destroy something British. So that's why I got the old Jag, and we painted the whole thing as a giant Union Jack, kind of like the Shaguar from uh, Austin right. Powers. Right. And so when it when it jumped and it went nose down and started falling, it was just this fantastic British flag <laughs> falling 300 <laughs> feet until it just smashed on the ground below. It was beautiful. Wow. All right. We got to check that out. So All I right. will definitely check that out. Cool. All right. So now we're going to get to keep cash or crush. So I did right. give you a five minute heads up about this. Uh, so I give you three cars. You have to pick one to keep forever, one to cash in and one to crush, unfortunately. Uh, I feel like you're okay sending a car to the crusher since you're jumping jags off of uh, cliffs to their death, right? Yeah, sure. All right. So I'm going to give you three cars. They're all in Arm Sotheby's auction. Uh, they have a little historic significance. They're all approximately the same value. I'm not giving you anything over a million dollars because that would just be cruel. Uh, all right. First ones, we have a 1994. I don't know if you saw this, but we have a 1994 Nissan Skyline GTR, but this is one of the factory race cars estimates okay. 500 to 550 mm -hmm. we have a now this one's not a race car but i know you'll like this a 1985 roof btr 11 nice. 600 to 800 grand uh -huh. and then the last one we're going british going jaguar 1993 jaguar xj220 which really should be called the xj217 450 <laughs> to 550 <laughs> you're probably yeah. the only one that would get that joke <laughs> uh, yes, I did. I totally got that joke. Um, so what my choices are crushing, keeping, and... Cashing. Cash one in. Cool. Bugger. Um, oh, I'd hate to crush any of those. Oh, my gosh. Um, hmm. Uh, you're killing me. This is like when people ask me what my favorite car is, and I can't do it because I got yeah. too many favorites. Uh, the 220... Um, I would, oh, that means I can't keep anything else. Dang it. I'd keep the 220. Really? Okay. Um, I, those are really awesome cars. I mean, although it's all got like Ford Mustang dials inside of it. I mean, it's, it's pretty, <laughs> it's not the most exotic exotic, but they're rare. They are 200 mile an hour cars. They held the record of the Nuremberg ring forever. Um, because it was one of the first ground effects production cars you could buy. Uh, that car, is, I still have, think, has a lot of legs. Um, I'd, oh, I'd cash the roof. Mm. And I'd keep the skyline. No, I'd, I'd sell. No, what is my choice? I, I, I can't crash. <laughs> I can't crash the skyline. Ah, oh, bugger. Um, hmm. Uh. I think I just I crash the roof just for the fun of it, and <laughs> and I'd sell the skyline. How about that? Okay, so you're actually these are, crushing these are all the, bad choices. These are yeah, all they bad are. Choices. Yeah, you're actually crushing the most expensive one. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. You got to yeah. follow your heart. All right. <laughs> I, I no, that's that's off the cuff, and I'm totally wrong and totally right about all three. That's right. I agree with you. I was surprised you weren't going to crush the Jag. But that's the temptation. Everybody wants to crush a Jag, but I, even though that car was a huge disappointment because it was originally supposed to be four wheel drive, it was originally supposed to be a V12, it was supposed to go up against like the 959. They had all these plans for it and they didn't build it. They stuck, you know, a six cylinder out of a, a Austin Metro rally car in it, and which doesn't run worth hell unless it's wide open. I mean, that car has a lot of flaws, but it's beautiful. It is. Uh, I, I, I just, I already destroyed a Jag 
this year, so I'm not going to destroy another one. <laughs> <laughs> and ours is maroon, which I think it's the first one I've ever seen maroon. Usually I see silver, honestly, silver. So yeah. It's a yeah. good color. Um, all right. No, that's fair. All right. Well, I want all of my listeners to uh, go check out your YouTube channel to check out the hijinks you're up to. So uh, thank you for joining the Collector Car Podcast today. Thanks for having me on. It's been a blast. Thanks for listening to the Collector Car Podcast. Don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes and be sure to follow us on Instagram and everywhere else at the Collector Car Podcast. <laughs>